So a new series of Laker Gale is coming your way over the coming weeks on TG Carr. It is one of the finest GEA productions out there looking back at the careers of some of the, our greatest ever players. One of them is alongside me in studio now. Graham Gerdy, how are you? Not too bad. How are you? Good. So when they first approach you to take a look back and reminisce and get all nostalgic, is that something you're comfortable with? Uh, at first, probably not, because usually you, you associate these with people that are they're gone by days I suppose and, and uh, I probably wouldn't have laid myself in that bracket but uh, unfortunately I am and, and, and uh, I suppose it's always nice to reminisce and look back on your career and It probably is actually a very good time to do it in that yeah. like, it's it's probably still some of, it, some of it's 25 years ago 20-25 years ago so yeah. for a younger generation they're not fully aware of the greatness of that Meath team but also you're at an age where it's still fresh enough in your mind you can remember all the good times and the bad uh, times Yeah well, some of it will be fresh but then I suppose when you go through the programme and reminisce over t- gone things in the past um, it kind of brings up stuff you forget about and, and it's always nice to remember those as well mm. What were the difficult parts of it? Oh, well I suppose obviously the the incident in Australia probably would have been the hardest thing for me and I suppose like for me it was all kind of dead and buried and then when you you know you bring it back up again it's it's it's, it's tough it's tough talking about it I suppose because uh, it was probably one mistake that I would regret probably or one instant or one saying mm. that I regret saying but uh, you know I suppose you have to live with these things you know I said it and I, I, I apologise and regret saying it but obviously you know we have to move on and, and so we hold our hands up I think Did it take you long to move on at the time? Uh, I suppose it did because it was you know particularly when I was playing against some of the bigger teams, uh, it was always brought up, you know, to try and, and, and rile you, you know, and I suppose the media probably wouldn't let you forget it as well. Yeah. I think. For, for me, whether it was good or bad, you were always in the media for, for something and they always seemed to to write about me, I think. But obviously when you were, when media were going well, you know, they needed something to, to write yeah. on the, on the broadsheet. So, th- so there was a lot of sledging, was there? Uh, there would have been, yeah. Not, I suppose it does not as much now. I don't think, but uh, definitely back then there would have been, yeah. Mm. So it's something that is brought up for in the initial years afterwards. Like, is it is it something even now that you look back and go, like that's a pretty dark day. Like, it, it's something. It, it's it's one comment, but something that, as you say, you instantly regret something you know you shouldn't have said, shouldn't shouldn't have happened. Yeah, but that. Yeah. It, it, when people say Graham Gardy's name, it's, it's something that's still at the forefront. Of oh, definitely, yeah, I know. So, and it's 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 gone back a long time now. But it'll lo- it'll always be there. It'll always follow me around. But um, as I said, it's an incident that was regrettable. But unfortunately, it happened, and you know I have to live with that. Obviously, my my children probably wouldn't realise. I'm sure they'll probably hear at some stage, mm. probably in 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 their lives. But. Uh, I suppose they're they're old enough now to make up their own minds and, and, and decide for themselves kind of really, you know. Yeah. Going back over the international rule stuff and ending up unconscious in hospital, like that period, what was that like? Because like, you're again you're you're very much the centre of attention. You're on, on every front page and back page. Yeah, I suppose like it was you know, looking back and it was the incident itself for me there wasn't a whole lot wrong with it I think the tackle itself but uh, I suppose the motion afterwards where you kind of were slammed to the ground but I think the the reason that happened is because I couldn't get my hands out I was you know my hands were tied so um, but probably the most frightening thing about that afterwards waking up in the ambulance was having to look at Mocky Regan looking in the back doors me so that was <laughs> <laughs> and anyone was involved with Mead and, 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 and Leinster and and, and uh, Oh, so Ireland would know who Mackie was. He was a masseuse probably for for twenty years with that with Mead and you know was involved with the Irish rugby team as yeah. well and soccer teams and you know so that was that was scary. <laughs> <laughs> you would have had your fair share of bumps and bruises down the years, but waking yeah. up in the back of an ambulance, like, yeah. are you genuinely fearful of? Well, something pretty serious has obviously just happened. Yeah, and I kind of I was I was over in in the matter afterwards and. Uh, just lying in the bed and I was still kind of, you know, seeing stars really and, and wondering probably how the game was going on and how I was going to get out of there. But uh, obviously it was a little bit more serious than that and, and uh, I would have suffered a concussion. But I ended up leaving the hospital that night, which probably I shouldn't have really, you know. But, uh, you know, it's, it's it was unfortunate it happened. But at that stage it was kind of part of the game really as well. Not, you know, not getting knocked out, but the physicality 
was part of the game. Yeah, like nobody's ever seen Sean Boylan quite as upset as he was after that game. And we had a panel even just before Christmas where Sean was in and he was yeah. talking about the Australian rules. And still, you could sense his annoyance and his frustration and almost a, a feeling of responsibility that he had allowed this to happen to his players somehow. Yeah, I think and because like it had spilled over um, from the first game and I think during the week as well some of the Australian players would have highlighted that they were going to get revenge from the first game and uh, you know that was probably just one instant like it did it did spill over a lot of times after and I suppose every manager has a responsibility for his players mm-hmm. as well and I suppose being a mead man as well probably Sean would have had that much more affiliation to himself really but uh you know, obviously he was he was disappointed. Like we all know, Sean over the years, he's you know he's a fair man. He plays he plays it tough as well, and uh, but fairly so. He wouldn't you know agree to that kind of action at all by the Australians, really. When did you first meet Boylan? Uh, I would have met him uh, in nineteen ninety. I um, obviously we knew who he was, but uh, I would have come in from I was still playing minor, and he brought me in for. Uh, I suppose training that time the league started in October and it ran until Christmas and then we had a break then for a few weeks so I went in from from September uh, till Christmas and then mm. I went back then with the minors and I'd done the same then the following year you know after the the uh, the famous four in a row games for Dublin Mead were beaten in the All Ireland final that year and I went in then kind of full time on the panel then after that you know so I think Sean kind of had that idea where he would bring lads in and give them a taste of the action and then, you know... What was he looking for? Was, was it physical strength? Like, you think of that Mead side of the turn of the late 80s, early 90s, like, one of the most physically brutish squads yeah, we've ever seen. Yeah. Like, are you going up against Mick Lyons in, as a 17-year-old in training? Oh, uh, no, you would be, yeah. Yeah, I suppose that was the, the trail of it for me as well. You were playing against all these, your idols over the, you know, the previous, probably... 10, 15 years and, and uh, it was always my ambition to play for, for me and to get to play with those players was fantastic for a few years and mm. obviously they've moved on but we'd, it'd still be, you'd still see them around and be in contact with them so it was uh, it was fantastic to play for them but it, it took me two years to break into the championship side like I didn't make my championship debut until it was 93 against Leash but uh, you know, I suppose getting the experience of playing with those players mm. As you say, he probably brought in a lot of young players, and not all of them would have made it all the way through. Mm. What was it? Do you think Boyden looked for in young players? What What did you have to do to earn his trust to get a championship start? Well, I suppose like um, particularly that team. I, I think he was looking for lads that were willing to get stuck in and were able to look after themselves on the pitch as well. Um, obviously, players with a bit of pace as well, which I had. Um, but uh, I think it was just lads that wanted to play for the county and really wanted to, you know, it was a huge effort at the time, maybe not as much as there is now, but it was still, you know, a lot of time out of your life and, and, mm. and you know, your, I suppose, daily jobs as well. So it was, you know, it was tough. And anybody that played for the county, including now, like there's a lot, not a lot of work goes into it rather than just, kind of just playing the game. How badly did you want it? I wanted more than anything, you know. So it was that it was my childhood dream to play for Mead and to play in Crow Park, and um, you know, it was fantastic to eventually get there and to be successful then with them was was I suppose a bonus. Mm. It, the f- years then when you're winning all Irelands and captaining Mead to all Irelands, like you become a, a superstar basically of, of Irish sport. Everybody knows well, who you are. <laughs> the, were you comfortable with that were you comfortable with the attention you were getting yeah I didn't mind it at all because uh, I suppose you know if you were if you were getting attention obviously you were successful and that was probably the main aim mm. um, you never really look for for, for limelight but uh, like it's always nice to get it as well but I suppose it comes with its troubles <laughs> as well because you're, you know no matter what you do then you know you're you're a target really but uh you know, I enjoyed it. Um, I suppose if you're looking back, would you change it? Probably not, you know. But, uh, you know, it was good while it lasted. Yeah. Did Boylan have the ability to get that blend of, like, incredibly intense training sessions and giving you a bit of light relief? Did he Did he have that balance? Oh, he did. Very like, well? Yeah, and I think that's the main difference between then and now. Like, f- for me, it's, it's so serious now. Sean didn't mind, lads. You know, I suppose once they put it in and training and put it in the games and we were getting results, he didn't mm. mind lads kind of, you know, letting loose now and again as well. I think. How tough were those early sessions, the the winter sessions? But like, was this always 
Betty Sound Beach run until you yeah, drop. Yeah, well, that was kind of, you know, more spring kind of pre-championship stuff up in the Hill of Tara then as well. You know, I suppose in the Park Talton and the back of Park Talton were, at the, the time, the ground wouldn't have been brilliant. Like, so you were slogging out there and, you know, we often played rugby in training and, and, you know, it was tough, especially if you're going up against, like, Liam Harn and, um, you know, Mick Lyons and all <laughs> <laughs> Colin Coyle, all those physical players. You'd make sure you're on the same team yeah. as them anyway. But, uh, no, it was good. And I suppose once they seen that you were getting stuck in as well, you got that bit of respect from them too. Yeah. Like, I say superstar because like we think back to, was it the game against Louth where you're getting a helicopter up yeah. from the wedding and that? There's, what, 25, 30,000 people watching a yeah. qualifier? Uh, that must have been a bit, a bit bizarre. Oh, it was, it was, it was fantastic. Um, good friend of mine, Richard Lynch, was getting married in, in, in Wexford and I said to Sean, if, you know, about a couple of weeks before when we knew the fixture was coming out, I said, I have a problem, like, so I have a wedding that day and he said, where is it? Wexford. Oh, shall we send a helicopter down for you? Is that all right? <laughs> yeah, Grant. So, uh, yeah. Well, it was, was Boylan the type where instantly you knew a helicopter was coming? Yeah, you well, weren't quite sure whether he was Yeah, well, so it was like, you know, Key Pack were, were, were big sponsors <laughs> of the Mead team at the time. And, and um, you know, there was like we were no strangers to helicopters landing at, at mm. training because Kevin Cahill was, was, was a member of the panel as well. And uh, he was working for Key Pack. So he was. He was involved, I think, in, in the plant down in Cork, so he was flying up and down for training the whole time. So we, we were used to kind of helicopters coming and going. But well, uh, common thought they were impressive these days by having their own bus. But yeah. Mead back in the nineties had their own helicopter. Yeah, we had our own bus, but it wasn't. Now it was it wasn't up to the yeah. I suppose the standards that I have now. I suppose all right. But uh, yeah, no, that was enjoyable. And, and I suppose to win the game in the way we did, and then you know fly back down to the wedding and get everybody, you know. You know, with the reception there for me when I arrived, it was it was fantastic. Like it was, it's you know, I suppose if you could dream it up, it probably wouldn't have happened. You know. Yeah, we were looking back through some of the archives, and I'm sure it probably comes up in Lake Regale as well. Of your, uh, your dip into the world of football, uh, which I think was probably with you. Were you play? I know you played a bit of rugby as well. Yeah. So when you were playing yeah. for me, were you playing soccer? Were you playing rugby? Not really. I hadn't pl- in my earlier years. I had, but then it was kind of getting really too much. Really, but uh, I played. L- most of my um, other football with Kent Stem Rovers really not to a, a, a fantastic standard but I suppose that trial all came about um, through I suppose Alex Ferguson's mm. comments uh, yeah we have Alex Ferguson's comments here actually yeah. I thought the, the, the entertainment value was very good a bit different from what you're used to oh much much more anybody out there impress you yeah, I thought um, I thought oh, I just scored the goal for number five for Meath. Grim liked, Garrity. Yeah, Grim Garrity, that's right. I was trying to get his name there. I thought he did very well. Number 14, very aggressive player for Meath. And Dublin, um, number 11, did well. You haven't brought the checkbook to buy any of them, have you? No, I've no money left. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't bring the checkbook. You didn't end up going to Manchester United. You did go on trials, though? Yeah, I went to try this arsenal. Um, that all came about probably about three weeks after that. Right. And uh, a fella called Bill Darby, who's a scout here from Dublin, he uh, got in touch with with uh, my dad at the house, and um, I wasn't actually there at the time. Uh, we have to play another twenty one match, and I, I, I spent the night in Navan. So I got a phone call to say, "Listen, get your ass out here quick!" There's a scout coming from Arsenal. I didn't believe him at the time, but. Uh, Without anyone had a chat with him, obviously, like you're going to say, yeah, you'll go. Uh, so, and was that off the back of of the Leinster final of them yeah, watching you? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, match? because they wouldn't have they wouldn't have seen me playing soccer, like yeah. you know. So it was, and I hadn't played soccer for a couple of years or football, whatever you want to call it, for a few years. So, um, you know, it was a bit out of the blue, all right. Yeah, yeah Anthony Tobel had a try with United. I think about a month mm. before that as well so it was I think when they seen going back years ago with Kevin Moore and and you know and Niall Quinn were, were, were Gaelic players and had had made a transition but they were probably more involved in, with the you know the football here yeah. in, they thought maybe it was an easy enough transition yeah and I think you know having if you were given the time I think they were looking for someone at the time to replace Lee Dixon and he played for a few years after that um, I played right full and I played midfield but and thought I'd done quite well I enjoyed it 
How long were you there for? I was there for just under two weeks. Like, but it's it's this not. A, George Graham was still manager. Yeah, yeah. So it's not enough of time to to. I suppose to your authority and having you're still trying to fit in and, and well, you're also probably if you haven't really played that much yeah, football for a couple yeah. of years you're trying to find your touch I'd imagine yeah well I think that was the main thing for me like my first touch probably wouldn't have been brilliant like mm. I was strong I was quick I was good in the air you know so I had all those kind of attributes but I suppose the, the first touch wouldn't have that would have let me down ultimately that was kind of the I think one of the reasons that uh, I didn't stay what was Boylan's attitude to you going over to Arsenal well I think me were finished at that stage so I think he was probably hoping that I'd be back in a couple of weeks but uh, but um, I think if if you did make it Sean he's that kind of character he'd be very happy for yeah. you you know you, you were only what 21 at, at yeah, that time yeah. and as you said your dream growing up was to play for me yeah. was there any part of you when you left Arsenal that started thinking well wait a second if, if one of the greatest clubs in the world are looking me as a professional footballer maybe that's a route I could go down maybe yeah. not starting at that level but going in playing League of Ireland maybe going across to the championship yeah it was not really no I didn't I didn't think about it at all after that I was probably a home board as such I was delighted to maybe be back um, but uh, even though I was only away for two weeks <laughs> but uh, you know it's it's something probably now you would look back and say you know if I gave it a better goal but I think well, I gave it as good a shot I could have when I was there mm. Um at the time, I think uh, Brian Robson, he was uh, involved at Middlesbrough, and I got a call from Des Scahill, the race commentator, who was very friendly with Robson, and uh, he said, would you accept a call from him? He's interested in having a chat with you. And I said, I would, but it, the call never came anyway, so it, it, it's, it's something you'd probably live to wonder, really, you know? Yeah, what might have been. Mm-hmm. You got your couple of All Ireland medals, anyways, with me, which more than made up for it, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think like I suppose every young player playing for the county wants to wants to win in Ireland at mm. some stage, and you know t- to win two probably you know is fantastic in in any player's lifetime, really. Where are they? Uh, they're at home in the house, <laughs> <laughs> somewhere. Somewhere, we were we were looking around our studio here at some of the memorabilia. Yeah, we had. You, you were saying you used to have quite a bit of it. I used to have quite a bit up to about two years ago. I was I was clearing one of the rooms upstairs and put a lot of jerseys and and balls and memorabilia into uh, three or four plastic bags or black bags and left them in the garage, kind of to sort out at a later date. And my wife was having a spring clean at the same time, so I think they all ended up they all end up uh, in the one place. I think. Oh no! Yeah. So. I know. So some scavenger hunter has uh, found himself. Oh, I'm sure. Days. Yeah, yeah. I would have kind of over the years. I would have spotted different jerseys I've I had kind of on people's backs and mm. in different towns. What were the me. ones that you felt were quite valuable? Well, it, I suppose the the big thing for me uh, was a ball I had signed by the Seven All Ireland winning captains for Mead. Right. And uh, sadly, it was some of them were no longer with us, but like. To have that, I have a picture at home of the seven of us together. Um, but to have the ball as well would have been nice. But I had uh, so all Ireland winning balls, uh, balls signed. I would have um, played with with um, with Ireland. Uh, had a rugby ball come out of the old Lansdown Road. Came from under the stand. Someone handed, gave it to me one day. I think it was going back to the thirties. So you know those things would have been nice to have. And obviously your you know your jerseys. Um, I was never really one for keeping jerseys anyway. I, I always there was always some little You don't want a Trevor Giles short sleeved? No, no, there was always some little kid swinging out, you're coming <laughs> off a game and, and, and you you know, you were glad to you know, to give them a, yeah. a jersey and, and you know, keep them happy but uh yeah, no, I've I've practically nothing left. Yeah, now. that's a shame. And I I wonder like to have a signed ball by the seven mead captains yeah. like yeah. Th- that's the type of thing quite literally money can't buy no you can't and I suppose that's probably one of the bigger things that you know would have went but uh, I suppose you still have the memories anyway you know mm. the level of commitment that you put in over those years was clearly something you wanted to do when you got the rewards out of it when you look at where me there are now and it seems strange to think that like we're heading into a championship where it will probably be the shock of all shocks if Meath were to go and beat Dublin at some stage yeah. over the course of the championship oh, definitely, when you look yeah. back to when you were 20, 21, 22 if the, that was now could you see yourself putting in the same level of commitment if there weren't the potential yeah, rewards I think, there 
I think for a while you probably would, but if you weren't getting any reward and, you know, the amount of time that the players put in, uh, even, you know, outside what they do with Meath or, mm. or, or, or their county, um, you know, it's phenomenal, you know, and to get to the standard of level of fitness they're at and to get their bodies into the shape they're in requires an awful lot of work and I I just don't know whether I'd be able for it now really, you know. <laughs> not Obviously not now, I wouldn't be anyway, but yeah. it, it's... It's a lot of a lot of time away from probably family and friends and nights not going out and, and sacrificing a lot of things just to play for your county. And I think we've seen that in the, now where a lot of players just take time out and, and you know, head off to explore the world as well. Mm. Like one Leinster title since two thousand and one for me. Where did it all go wrong? Yeah, look it's it's I don't know, it it's probably chopping and changing managers as well. If you look at Sean was there for 23 years so we had that kind of balance and we we haven't had that since um, you know new managers come in and they I suppose bring in new players as well a new coach and staff and it, it does disrupt you know if you haven't like it's okay for Dublin where they have huge huge panels and they have probably that continuous you know blend coming with, with managers and, and so it's backroom team moving on with teams as well but it's it's just difficult to see where Mead are going to improve in the next year or two to, you know, combat what Dublin have done over the last 15 years. Mm. It's over 20 years since you won your first All-Ireland. It won't be that long till you'll be on the pitch at halftime <laughs> in, in Crow Park, which is a rather depressing thought in many ways. Yeah, we were just actually talking about that a couple of uh, couple of weeks ago, myself and Tommy Dowd, and, and it was... Uh, yeah, so we we'll cross that hurdle when we come. Do you meet up often? Like, are, are you good at getting back together? Um, sometimes, usually, we'll try to have kind of something once a year, but it's probably it gets harder and harder. I would see Tommy a lot because he Tommy has a business in in in, in my hometown, and I would have met him actually last last Sunday morning. It was one time probably we had the Sam Maguire. I think we robbed it from Dublin somewhere. Uh, we were at a um, a birthday party out on the Causey Farm, which is not far from my house. And uh, there was a guy, he was 100 years of age. So a friend of his decided to have uh, the Sam Maguire and uh, it was for the, the previous All Ireland winning captains as well for oh, me. So it wow. was a fantastic surprise for him. I just don't make it too much of a surprise as he is 100 years of age. So we don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to shock him. Shock him too much. Uh, yeah, Peter Clark. So he was, he was in fine form and. and I suppose if we all live to, to see a hundred, we'd be doing well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully he might, well, hopefully, yeah. Uh, when If you're living to a hundred, you'll see a few more meals. Well, Ireland yeah, please God, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Graham, it's been brilliant having you in studio. Best of luck. Thanks very much.